So as a technical aside, uh, let me go through uh, and sketch uh, the uh, derivation of the structure of a turbulent jet, in particular the conical shape that we have uh, when the flow is turbulent. So in order to study the mean flow profile, we begin with the Navier-Stokes equations, which describe the momentum conservation and mass conservation or continuity of an incompressible so-called Newtonian fluid. So uh, this is a complicated set of equations. In particular, we have this nonlinear term here, which is the inertial term. And we've already said that we have a high Reynolds number and turbulence results because the inertia is very strong compared to the viscous term, which is here. So that's the uh, uh, divergence of the viscous stress or the viscous forces on the fluid. So these two terms we know are important. They have to balance. And the inertia is particularly strong and is what leads to the very complicated uh, flows that we see. So you can solve these equations numerically on a computer and generate simulations that look a lot like experiments on turbulent jets. What I'd like to do here is just to derive by simple scaling arguments what sort of the structure of the solutions uh, could look like. So these two terms, as we just indicated, are the ones that are most likely to balance in the time average flow. So let's consider um, a time averaged a steady flow, which has a velocity components, um, <clears throat> which has, has a velocity component Vz that depends on R and Z, okay? So it's, uh, so it's basically something like this, which is basically expanding, uh, but has a certain uh, sort of localization of the flow in the middle, and it's smooth because we're averaging over all the complexity of the jet, so the jet looks something like this with all kinds of vortices and eddies that are getting bigger as it goes, as you're entraining more and more uh, air uh, from, from the outside. So we're gonna look at the time average flow, and we're also going to uh, importantly, um, assume uh, that we have a uh, eddy viscosity. So the kinematic viscosity nu in the equations as I've written them here, rep it represents the diffusion momentum. If a parcel of fluid is moving with a certain momentum, it has a chance of passing that momentum to the neighboring fluid and moving it along with it. And that is accomplished through viscous stresses. So the eddy viscosity basically assumes that that diffusion process from momentum happens at the scale of the largest eddy in the flow. And so we've talked about the assumption of eddy diffusivity, but for eddy viscosity, what I'll write is the eddy viscosity is a typical velocity, which is Vz, times a length scale, which is delta. So what I'm saying here is that with this, is that if I go out to a certain position Z, and I ask myself, what is the sort of width of the jet at size z? Then there's all kinds of eddies, but the largest eddy is kind of at that scale. And so if I write down an eddy viscosity, it's going to be the sort of average velocity there times that scale. OK, so that's going to be the eddy velocity. And I'm going to replace, so when I do my time averaging, I'm going to re replace the microscopic viscosity of the fluid, kinematic viscosity, with the eddy viscosity. So that's an important uh, uh, modification. And so if I do that, if I do this time averaging and look at the eddy viscosity, then I take these two terms and balance them. I'm going to get um, Vz bar, so that's my average Vz. And I'm looking at the z component of momentum here, of that uh, first Navier-Stokes equation. And I get d uh, Vz dot uh, derivative of Vz with respect uh, to z plus uh, Vr, and there's also an R component of velocity. So there's also some velocity, in fact, which is coming in uh, from the sides. But I'm just going to be interested in this uh, term here, uh, Vz um, dr. And I'm going to balance this against um, the eddy viscosity, V eddy, or new eddy, I should say. Sorry, new eddy is eddy viscosity. Um, times, and then the Laplacian is 1 over r ddr r dvz dr. Okay, so that's just the Laplacian in cylindrical coordinates. And now I'm going to make the assumption that this Ve scales as V bar z times 
delta. And so now I'm going to do a scaling analysis on this equation. And so what we see is we have vz over z times, uh, and then at least for that first, so I should say these two terms will be of comparable size because of incompressibility, the second equation. I won't go through the details of that. And we'll just do a scaling argument balancing these two terms. So if I look at vz divided by z times vz, so that's a scaling of those two terms, I can balance that against vz delta times, and the scale for r is delta. So I have 1 over delta for the 1 over r, 1 over delta for the derivative times delta times 1 over delta vz. So there's a lot there, but notice the vz's all cancel, and we're left with a bunch of deltas here, and how many, because of the eddy viscosity, we are left with um, the, all of this is just 1 over delta. There's a 1 over z, and so we find here that delta scales as z. So in other words, we have a conical shape. Okay. So the boundary layer thickness is a constant times z, and what we write is that delta is equal to alpha z specifically, and we define the turbulent entrainment coefficient alpha that way. And then once we've done that, we've already shown uh, that <clears throat> from, from uh, the momentum flux that vz uh, scales as the square root of k over rho air uh, times 1 over delta. So this basically now gives me the scaling of the problem. In fact, there is a similarity solution for the shape of this profile that one could solve for, and it has the form that, uh, for example, the uh, vz is square root of, because alpha is, uh, d delta is, is proportional to z, so it's the square root of k over rho a z times some function of r over alpha z. And then there's a similar expression for the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the other velocity component. And the function f is, looks very much as I've sketched here. It's essentially a, a Gaussian type profile or a bell curve that kind of localizes the velocity you know, across this distance uh, delta. The second thing that we're interested in is the mean concentration. And that would be a concentration of, uh, let's say, virions contained in uh, infectious aerosol droplets. So there's a mean concentration profile in the jet, assuming that we are injecting a fluid of a constant concentration at uh, the source of the jet. Uh, so again, we can do some scaling arguments here. So if we ask ourselves, what is the mass flow rate through a slice? or actually the volumetric flow rate, excuse me. Um, that is, uh, we'll just call that Q, um, and it'll just be sort of an average. Um, this will be the average velocity times the cross-sectional area at a given position. So this is scaling like, uh, so area scales like delta squared, and then the velocity scales in this way is 1 over delta, so this ends up scaling as k over rho a uh, times just delta. So the uh, volumetric flow rate is increasing with r, and that's a sign that we are actually entraining fluid, as I indicated. This is not just the fluid we're injecting, but it's moving forward and it's sucking more fluid in, and all that fluid is kind of becoming part of the turbulent jet as it grows. <clears throat> Now, if we ask, so this is our this is our uh, our flow rate, volumetric flow rate, but we can also ask ourselves what is the uh, uh, flux um, of concentration of let's say uh, virions per unit volume. Well, that would be the average concentration times the average flow rate, because flow rate is uh, volume per time and concentration is number per volume. So this is a number total number per time. And this, we will assume, should be a constant because, as you can see from this picture, if we're injecting a bunch of concentration of, let's say, droplets uh, here, 
uh, they will spread out in the turbulent flow, but they don't really have a good mechanism to get out of the turbulent flow. The turbulent flow is sucking fluid into the plume, and so the particles are just kind of well mixed in that plume, and we could assume they have a roughly constant concentration. And so um, if that's the case, uh, then we can, and, and in fact this constant would be lambda uh, uh, Q, if we're thinking of, for example, infection, if C is the concentration of infection quanta, then lambda Q is the rate of admission of ejection, infection quanta from the mouth. We've already talked about that quantity. And this is now telling me how the concentration of infection quanta decays with time. And so what we find, if we substitute now, is that the uh, concentration of infection quanta at a position Z scales as, um, so I have to divide by Q, so I get the inverse of this. So I get square root of rho A over K, and then I have lambda Q over alpha Z. So this tells me that if I plot as a function of distance from the mouth in the direction of the jet, the concentration of infection quanta that are carried by virions in aerosol droplets, uh, then you know somewhere here I have, let's say, at, at z equals zero is the mouth where I'm exhaling, and the concentration there is actually C Q. In fact, that is something we've talked about before, which is the con that that's the key disease parameter, the concentration of infection quanta in the exhaled breath of an infected person. So we know at the mouth that's what we start with. And what the turbulent theory is telling us is how that concentration is decaying with time, and it's decaying like one over Z. And so that tells us sort of our relative risk of infection at different positions relative to being mouth to mouth with the infected person. 